This is Colleen Curran, and I'm happy to be here with you today. I arrived in the Rogue Valley in 1976, having come west from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean in the centennial, bicentennial year, and um, was, oh, just dazzled by Southern Oregon. A professor of Old English had suggested that I might like this area because um, of the Shakespeare Festival. And as an English major and a native West Virginian, I was delighted to find the beautiful horizon, the landscape and the beauties of nature, and also respect for the arts, which was a wonderful surprise. So I arrived and stood in the rain, a standing room only ticket to see Measure for Measure on a very rainy night in um, July of 1976. And I first went to the library. I visited the Medford Headquarters Library and some of the branch libraries and felt right at home. I um, found work with the school district office and cataloged professional library materials by hand in the early pre-digital days, consulted with the specialists in all the different um, areas of audio and um, special ed and each of the um, school district branches in Jackson County. <clears throat> and wrote a film catalog by hand, typed it out, and it was bound by a printer. Um, and at that time, I became acquainted with the personnel director and some other professional women in the area who were involved in um, the women's rights efforts here and invited me to attend a NOW meeting. I'm not really a person who joins organizations, but when I met with the local NOW group, I was um, pleased to find a group of women and their women's partners, men and women, who were working for um, the extension of equal rights throughout the United States. And it felt important to me. And it was fun, but it wasn't just filling time. Everyone was committed to the larger effort. And I learned that the National Organization for Women here was connected nationally to organizations everywhere. And it felt like a network, a strong and resilient network of people who cared about women being fully included in the Constitution and in our national life. The local activities here included the presence in the 4th of July parade when we won the, um, or didn't win, but should have won, the, the prize for our little engine that could, ERA, float. We walked every year and received resounding audience um, approval. And it was great to feel part of the community and that we were among those who expected um, that women would be fully recognized for contributions to our world. Other than our involvement in the local Fourth of July parades, we were a presence throughout the region with a speakers bureau and um, a resource organization in conjunction with other local women's rights groups that um, now brought speakers. We brought nationally known speakers. Ellie Smeal came to talk to us and um, Gloria Steinem was here. We had kind of a, a hub of, of women's voices, publicly known women's voices were um, heard here and 
We had speakers through the university and through the um, Dunn House and Rape Crisis Center, through later through community works when they joined forces, and the work in the county. Um, we'd worked to have the county approve a measure that would require county um, officials to travel only to states that had ratified the ERA. And that was quite an effort to um, move that through the county commissioners. And there were certain vested interests that came into play there. But we were a force to be reckoned with. And there was a sense of working together through all the women's organizations in the area, the Women's Center at SOU, the um, Women's Resource Center, and I think I'd said the Dunn House and Rape Crisis. And there were um, all sorts of supportive organizations, the um, Women Against Violence. We had marches to take back the night. I would need to look at the chronology to get everything in order, but we had lots going on through the month, through the, the seasons, through the year. Take Back the Night would be in the fall when it was getting darker. We had women's history events through the county, many speakers in Ashland, but there was a there were street banners which must be stored somewhere. And the Women's Commission was a place that could field um, complaints and publicize efforts for, for matters of importance to women and, and therefore to men because the emphasis was for now, the National Organization for Women was had defined its purpose as those who cared about women's rights. And men were active and involved and fully participating in all our events. It was not an exclusive um, group that left anyone out. It was everyone. <laughs> My work with the school district came to a close and I spent a while working for the 1980 census which continued well into the fall of 1980. Um, did some freelance work through 1981 and um, in the fall of 1981 I was visiting the East Coast and spending time with family and was able to attend the now National Conference in Washington, D.C. And um, there was a great surge of support for the ERA movement, which was closing in on the final required state's ratification. And um, during that visit, I signed a form that said, sure, I'd be glad to be a field organizer should you need me, just call, um, which seemed very unlikely, but why not? And um, that was in October of 1981. In January, early January of 1982, I was surprised to get a call from the National Office of NOW saying, well, how about driving to Illinois and being a field organizer? So it was a big step, a, a leap of faith for me. And um, I think the rental house that we were staying in, we found a, a sublet a person to stay there. And my partner and I drove east in midwinter and I first had to learn how to drive a stick shift of the little VW White Rabbit that was our transportation. We drove um, through 
through Eastern Oregon, hours and hours through Wyoming, where we saw not one light for hours and hours, although we could see stars. And we arrived in Chicago um, in mid-January in time to support um, a Republican candidate. We were advised to bring clothes in which we could walk among Republicans. So my, my partner then, husband later, found a three-piece suit that he wore <laughs> for his walking among Republicans. And um, we were impressed with the bipartisan cooperation on the ERA issue that leaders in both parties were committed and outspoken in support of equal rights for women. And I will recite the Equal Rights Amendment in total. <laughs> equal rights shall not be denied or abridged. Equal rights under the law <laughs> shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. And that is the total wording of the Equal Rights Amendment, which um, eventually provoked such dissension and fear and sort of standoffs, polarizing standoffs among um, neighbors and family members who we were visiting. We were um, sent to Springfield where we lobbied the legislature and then we were given our most long-lasting and rewarding assignment, a two-part assignment. Having just arrived from Oregon, I really um, was asked to lead the campaign of a state representative candidate, John Dunn, who had managed to um, alienate his former supporters because as a lifelong devout Catholic, his outspoken support of equal rights for women and a pro-choice stance had led to his fellow parishioners abandoning him and his longtime law partner became his opponent in this election and no one wanted to manage his campaign. So we were assigned to be a campaign manager for this state representative because no one wanted to be associated with him publicly and we were also assigned to heavily lobby a state Senate candidate to disavow the need for the three-fifths majority to pass the ERA in Chicago, in Illinois, because that had been a condition tacked on later, like the time limit for ERA passage. These had not been required for any previous constitutional amendment but in an effort to slow and stop the passage of this common sense measure, opponents kept putting up roadblocks. So we were working to secure the election of a pro-ERA, pro-choice Democrat in our area in Decatur and to pressure a kind of political animal um, candidate for the Senate to use his sway to um, give up the need for a three-fifths majority for passage. I hope that's clear. So our candidate scarcely dared go to his church because the parking lot would be leafleted with papers demonizing him and him and his family, and he didn't always feel safe. 
We arrived in town full of good intentions, but he didn't really want to be too closely associated with us either because we were the raving wild women feminists and their um, associates. So, so we arrived, and in this time, 1982, pre-computer, we were handed a box of file cards, just like a recipe box of index cards, which um, was full of names and addresses of people who might be willing to work with us. So we had a box and it was a treasure chest. So we were welcomed to homes of ERA supporters who might have felt embattled in their hometown, but who were committed to securing equal rights for their daughters, granddaughters, nieces, friends, everyone, everyone coming in the future so that um, all the young women and young men would be um, equally protected under federal law, under our Constitution. We met so many wonderful people and we were kind of a, a traveling show. We had a series, a daily, weekly series of phone banks and letter writing, letters to the editor, letters to representatives, just churning out um, pages and pages of persuasive prose encouraging the legislators to make good on, on their pledge to support and do their duty by all their constituents. And this involved being sure that all the letter writers had coffee and cookies or <laughs> donuts, that um, we could find a place with phones. People would volunteer office space that wasn't being used. Churches were willing, certain churches, the um, Unitarians were reliably supportive, although sometimes schedules were mixed and we would show up when a service was in, in progress. And um, people were very generous in giving all they could give. And also, the other side of it is working with volunteers people might change their plans and not feel that it mattered that much. So I know we'd scheduled one phone bank for an evening um, and the person who was going to host it fell off a stepladder and broke, <laughs> broke her shoulder, which was terrible. And um, we had to cancel. It was a daily, a daily, um, improvisation of responding to the circumstances and people's changing situations. It was also winters. There might be snow piling up um, outside the doors. There were icy roads and along with the letter writing we were organizing people to do regular canvassing, knocking on doors in neighborhoods, their own neighborhoods and other neighborhoods, not knowing what response they would get, um, and encouraging people to get out the vote and to vote for our candidate. We had receptions for our candidate, again, finding people who would volunteer spaces, volunteer refreshments, um, gathering support from the news media, letting them know when we'd have these receptions so they could come and get a, a statement from our candidate. It was kind of a non-stop generating momentum effort from January through late March when um, the primary election was scheduled. We did learn um, the circumstances of many people's lives and what had drawn them to commit themselves to equal rights for women when they might be at odds with um, those close to them. I heard stories of um, women in 
an apartment complex near where we stayed who were locked in their rooms during the day and their husbands would make sure they weren't not coming out or husbands who would not allow their women, their wives to meet with friends. I mean, they were very almost medieval sounding situations. So we worked with professional women who were aware that their careers were not taken as seriously or um, didn't give them the upward mobility that they might have gained had they been male in the same career. We just felt that tension in the lives of the families in this community and we really were accepted in this community for this brief time because people felt the essential significance of this measure in their lives, in their families' lives. It was mostly sort of prosaic juggling names and addresses, lists and lists of names and places and phone numbers and receptions and scripts and just I found these pages that I hadn't hadn't really looked at in years and the candidate's wife let us know how how wearing the campaign was for her and her family because they were walking a fine line in the community but she also very kindly said that we must be tired too um, people brought us meals and soothed our ruffled feathers and tired spirits and people had come from all over the country to work on this campaign. People had taken a break from their ordinary lives. It was a chance to affect history and we did succeed in our campaign. Our candidate won his primary bid and later won the seat in the general election and I, I just had this clipping because the local press said he rides crossover votes to win maybe it's the Equal Rights Amendment supporters who crossed over he said so he he was happy to claim our support on election day when his candidacy was um, was supported and it was a great a great day for us and for the people we'd become close to working around the clock day after day week after week and we felt um, reassured that victory was was within sight maybe within reach I might have mentioned that we were in the sort of back backyard of Phyllis Schlafly who had um, spearheaded the resistance to the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, she stirred up opposition saying what would happen to families if women weren't at home when the children came home from school. I mean the obvious irony is that she was never home when her children came home from school because she was out working to defeat the ERA. Um, and the um, insurance companies which had funded a lot of the resistance to the Equal Rights Amendment because they could see clearly that they would um, have a, a financial loss were women treated equally to men under health insurance guidelines. So we were faced with sort of daily repeated questions which do sound a little um, outdated now. What would happen if women and men were forced to use the same bathrooms? What if women and men both had to fight alongside each other in the military? What if women and men served in fire departments as, and as first responders together? Wouldn't that be awkward? Would men be able to control themselves? Were they, you know, changing into firefighter uniforms with women firefighters. 
um, all of these issues have kind of been resolved in practice that unisex restrooms are prevalent everywhere and no one has has yet been um, I think contaminated or you know twisted beyond recognition by using those as people have done in families for years and women have served with honor in the military and are able to benefit from the um, benefits of military service seeing the world and developing skills and it's a matter of individual choice whether to participate or not in military activity so the the fear tactics that were you know generated and um, stirred up in resistance to ERA passage have have kind of subsided there are no terrible terrible outcomes but because the 38 states required to pass ERA and ratify it as part of the Constitution were not reached before June 30th 1982 uh, an arbitrary deadline that was passed by um, those obstructing passage in Congress because that deadline passed without passage of ERA it was considered null and void <laughs> and has just sat um, for these 38 years um, until in recent years three states have passed the ERA have brought their their state's inclusion to um, just this past week in Virginia reached the 38 required and there will be quibbles and there will be some determination as to the standing of that um, passage, the ratification numbers, but it is a noteworthy, uh, we've reached a noteworthy objective and I think um, those who've worked on it during the years in the past and continuing now, I know that young women are, are um, noticing that it might be important to be included in the Constitution. When the ERA did not pass and the deadline passed with, with um, marches in many of the states marking that, that date with mourning and renewed determination to continue the battle there were also well, I think it, it's referred to as ERA casualties the people who had invested so much of their personal commitment and energy in this struggle and who'd given their all at the expense of all the other aspects of their lives there were instances of um, people who just were not able to continue and um, struggled with. I was going, I don't know if this is good, I was going to say there was depression and that is so associated with how women um, manage difficulties that it's almost um, a trope but there were people who were s severely dispirited and disheartened and were not immediately engaged in struggles for equal rights and fairness under the law. So there was suffering. And I think the recent passage of the required number of states for ratification may revitalize the spirits of those who care and who can see the possibility 
of equal rights under the law being protected in our Constitution. And I think the sense of being part of a national effort was no longer part of how we saw ourselves, that we were very focused on what we could do locally. I am speaking just for myself now because I, I would be happy to have a conversation with others about how this seems to them, uh, others' impressions of that time. Because we remained part, an active part of the national organization and the state organization, state and regional now had been very um, dynamic also. But people, I'll just say simply, did go back to their lives in some way. I mean, the things that had been put aside with that urgency, yes, exactly, of um, this must be done, this must be accomplished, this is our time, this is our moment, and we are the people. So we, we pushed, we surpassed ourselves, and then when it um, had not passed, we just needed to take care of ourselves and needed to restore, replenish. Mm -hmm.